All right, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this uh, workshop, which unfortunately, and against my prior intention, I had to miss a uh, more interesting part. This is about black hole interiors. Now, um, okay, well, the, in the, according to the uh, ancient uh, beliefs, or uh, sort of the people had a, a rather hazy idea about uh, geography, they thought. Uh, world sort of the earth which was pretty much the earth had boundaries and the boundaries were guarded by monsters and my point is that um, we still think pretty much that except that the monsters are being replaced by singularities in the modern <laughs> viewpoint and we shouldn't um, sort of feel condescendent when looking back at these uh, early days that certain ideas have sort of remained anyway uh, the Schwarzschild black hole, I assume, in, in this audience is generally known. Uh, it, it does have a singularity at the, uh, uh, at the in, inside the black hole uh, here, and it has another one inside the white hole, which is generally considered unphysical. Now, if you dive into the Schwarzschild black hole, uh, um, then you will just die at the singularity and there's not uh, much to talk about, except that you will um, uh, could note that you uh, uh, reach it in, in, in final time. Okay, so now the charged black hole or rotating black holes have a sort of more interesting uh, interiors, uh, at least from the viewpoint of the exact solutions that are supposed to represent them. Uh, there's a, an exterior, I'm restricting attention for now to a, asymptotically flat um, black holes, and I assume that people in this audience uh, can read Penrose's diagrams, uh, according to which this lines at uh, an angle of 45 degrees are null, and this, uh, this is still infinity, so this is the exterior. If you dive into the black hole, now there is another pair of uh, uh, killing horizons called the inner horizons or Cauchy horizons, uh, and beyond which you uh, enter a region again uh, having some sort of singularity, the nature of which uh, differs somewhat depending on whether you're talking about a charged or a rotating black hole. Now, for rotating black hole, this region has also all kinds of other bad pathologies, but it does not. Now, the observer uh, from before could now, uh, in, if Space time were truly uh, given, uh, represented by this uh, solution, could now uh, sort of dive through and uh, uh, dive uh, past these uh, uh, fiery rings that uh, he or she will see and uh, uh, move into uh, the next, the next uh, level to the next, I think it's right. My pointer just has died, but this also has given up, or have I, have I maybe turned it off? Nice picture to look at. Oh, here we go. I guess I assume I can, I can still. Oh, okay, well, I've explained what uh, was supposed to be seen here. Um, I, I mean, there's a, a whole a ladder now of worlds stacked on top of each other, and you could uh, fancy uh, going through them one after another. Uh, and the question is, how, uh, how realistic is this? The question is also how to... <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I can't put this into my computer. It's a slightly more modern model. Oh, or this one, okay. Okay. So here is again the same picture. Now, uh, it, it also there's this uh, so-called uh, Rosenbridge that is, is reminiscent of the Schwarzschild picture. So you could. Instead, ask a question, um, look at this from the viewpoint of causality. 
uh, saying that you uh, may be in a very idealized uh, way of thinking about this problem, you could uh, know all atoms and their positions and all fields and their values and their first derivatives if you're a mathematician knowing hyperbolic equations. And then you could say that in principle you could predict this uh, grayish uh, so-called domain of dependence. And uh, the, po the point here is that um, you can draw that domain of dependence for any region in flat space and you will have these future boundaries called Cauchy horizons. But if you just have a bounded region, uh, these uh, horizons mean nothing because they just say you could have, you've artificially chosen a, a small uh, domain and then the domain of dependence is small. But here you've chosen one which is possibly uh, conceivably as large as, as it could be. And there are these uh, regions here beyond the Cauchy horizons as they're called, which are not part of the domain of dependence and are therefore the values of fields propagating on this space time are not predictable from, from knowing the initial data on this initial slide. So you can say in a sense this is a violation of determinism or predictability or whatever. Uh, and um, it's a, the question is how seriously you should uh, kind of take this. So now you could of course, uh, take a pragmatic approach and say uh, this lack of determinism obviously has to do with the singularities. And you could imagine putting on some boundary conditions for the fields on the singularity. The singularities are kind of uh, actual singularities. Or you could imagine that maybe uh, you, you, you consider some slicing of this and then on each slice maybe consider some self-adjoint tension of a, of, a, of a Hamiltonian driving the system forward and uh, uh, certainly self-adjoint extensions for, for singular Hamiltonians with singular potentials or singular coefficients can certainly be uh, defined occasionally. But I think this is the wrong picture physically because a singularity is nothing like a conducting plate where you impose the uh, directly boundary conditions on on the electric fields out of pure laziness because you don't want to have to describe the electrons that move in this in this conductor, whereas in a complete description you should describe the electric field and the electrons. You just out of pure laziness you impose directly conditions. But here the, the, the singularity is nothing like a conducting plate. So the boundary condition should somehow in, uh, incorporate the, the physics that you you're you're out of laziness, ignoring, and there, it seems to me at least there is no reasonable choice you can make. So there is a certain uh, determinism, de determinism violation here, uh, which is more serious than in a space-time which has a, a boundary that you think of as some uh, conducting metallic state. Okay, so now uh, there is, um, one should note that uh, this, uh, as you probably know if you've read uh, Bob's uh, book, example that uh, this uh, whole picture is uh, a bit unphysical anyway because you should form somehow this black hole by uh, collapsing matter but uh, uh, you can you can convince yourself and this is in a paper by Bulwer uh, for example uh, early on that you can still uh, construct these kind of uh, uh, space times with the collapsing matter shells and they still contain at least part of this uh, region behind this Okay. Uh, okay, so now this comes to the cosmic censorship conjecture, uh, which uh, was uh, proposed, I think, by uh, Roger Penrose to somehow argue that this uh, cosmologic, this Cauchy horizon isn't really there in the first place. So that this, uh, this surface here is a, is a mere mathematical illusion. It's, a, it's, it's not really there. And the argument is, uh, for example, uh, can be made in this way, heuristically, that you imagine you have uh, two observers in red and in blue, one somewhat uh, uh, audacious, personality diving into the black hole, the conservative uh, person outside, and then there will be the conservative uh, person will send regular uh, 
light signals or text messages uh, to this uh, audacious friend and uh, at uh, regular intervals or at constant frequencies as measured by the red observer. And then because obviously the blue observer crosses the, the, the Cauchy horizon in finite time, the, these, uh, these signals will pile up or the local frequency seen by this uh, blue observer will be blue shifted. And this is, of course, the familiar blue kind of blue shift or red shift when looked at it backwards effect that you tend to have in, in, in black hole space times. And in a more realistic uh, uh, way of looking at it, you could think of instead of observers and, and sharp pulses, you could just think of, of, of sort of waves that are prepared here and that are ingoing and then uh, uh, the idea here is pretty much that the amplitude of the wave is not dangerously blowing up, but the transverse derivative across the wave oscillating uh, very rapidly. And because the stress energy tensor of a field um, and my, my coordinate across this horizon will always be V, because the derivative appears in the stress energy tensor, uh, it would uh, mean that somehow there are uh, some sort of infinite fluxes uh, at this Cauchy horizon. And if you stretch your imagination a bit and put that uh, imaginary stress energy tensor to the right-hand side of the Einstein equation, or you let the gravitational field as, act as its own source, which it can because it's a nonlinear field equation, then you would uh, be inclined to think that there is no reality to this Cauchy horizon, that it should somehow be converted into a sort of singularity. And then uh, people are following that to sort of uh, investigate it, uh, the, what would perhaps be the nature of this singularity. And um, example, well, there's a series of papers by Israel, Poisson, uh, Ori, Brady, many uh, people. And uh, it's kind of believed that the classical singularity is such that the tidal, um, tidal deformations are finite, but the tidal forces are, are infinite. And uh, in, in mathematics, there has been, um, a, 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 well, Christian Duller has proposed a way to formulate this. Uh, has to proposed a, a way to formulate it in terms of uh, a mathematical question of whether one can uh, uh, find a solution or possibly many solutions that are weak solutions but still uh, solutions in a, in a suitably strong sense, uh, which, uh, and, and that, that uh, this, this uh, Einstein equation is, uh, the, it transformed into the question whether this Einstein equation is, is or is not uh, um, weakly extendable as a solution in multiple, multiple ways. And there's, uh, for example, this work by Tafermos and Luke who looked at the vacuum Einstein equations, I think, who showed at least that the metric is uh, continuous, but I don't think they quite showed that the tidal forces diverge, but there's uh, lots of other works with uh, test fields and so on uh, that uh, uh, have looked into this and so a partial list of names. I apologize to any uh, scholars in the audience if, they, if you don't find the name there, which uh, give a kind of convincing, I think, uh, uh, a convincing, make a convincing case that this uh, idea of Penrose is, is more or less correct. Okay, so the, uh, what you should uh, think then that the Penrose diagram, apart from this uh, la layers and layers of worlds uh, stacked on top of each other, is sort of a much more mundane thing like this with an edge. Okay, so uh, in this talk, um, so this is uh, the strong cosmic censorship conjecture or theorem, depending on what you believe, think of as proven or, or, or indicative and so on. Um, and so again, the mathematical formulation that I know of and that I heard has been ascribed to Chris Cadullo is that um, it states that uh, for generic initial data, for me that means smooth, uh, the perturbation is uh, inextendable as an H1 lock, so one uh, derivative in still square integrable as across the Cauchy horizon. And for a, a Klein-Gordon field, which I think of as a, either a, a physical field in the space-time or as a, 
a sort of a replacement for a four man's replacement for the metric. Uh, uh, this would mean that the uh, that the stress energy tensor isn't integrable because this wouldn't be square integrable. So a square wouldn't be integrable. So the flux, which would be some sort of integral of the stress tensor, would be there. Okay. So now there's been uh, there's an, an interesting twist to this, uh, which uh, comes about by adding a cosmological constant, a positive, which uh, sort of turns this picture, uh, gives one uh, sort of region, one interesting new region to it. Of course, it again repeats itself, uh, which is this uh, uh, cosmological horizon. The horizons correspond to the roots of this function f uh, appearing in the metric. And now we'll call them h minus for inner horizon, h plus event, and hc cosmological horizons. There are some null coordinate, Kruskal type null coordinates going upright for V and up left for, for U. And these horizons have uh, different temp different in general temperatures, K called kappa. And uh, you can uh, now uh, make, uh, 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 again, think of this, uh, this thought experiment. But uh, as you know, in an, the exterior region of the black hole is exponentially expanding now. And so, there is an additional effect, namely that the amplitude of the field outside will, you still have this uh, blue shift effect, but now the amplitude will uh, go down exponentially. And so you have an, a, a large derivative, a large, uh, a large gradient, but a small amplitude. So it's a bit, uh, it's not so obvious which of the two wins. And uh, that quantity, which uh, perfectly expresses this competition between the redshift, so the exponential decay outside, and the blue shift here is this called quantity called beta, which uh, has nothing to do with an inverse temperature. It is a, a dimensionalless number, which is the quotient of the spectral gap of quasi-normal modes, so the decay rate, uh, uh, half, uh, um, how is it called? What's that called? Decay time, yeah, of the quasi-normal modes, so the, the ringing, uh, the, the slowly decaying uh, uh, waves that describe the sort of ringing of the black hole, the vibration, and the uh, kappa minus, which is the temperature of the, uh, the two. It's somehow the quotient between the two. Uh, that can, for example, be seen by a, a result uh, uh, as a um, Quite impressive, at least for me, a result by Hintz and Vasi, who showed that if you pose the initial value problem on this surface, then the solution at the Cauchy horizon will be in this uh, space h1 half, so half a uh, half plus beta of a derivative still square integrable, and uh, so. Uh, and then uh, you, how good this is then depends on the actual value of beta. And uh, kappa minus is a textbook exercise. You can, it's a locally calculable quantity from the metric. But alpha is a, is a sort of a frequency. So you have to solve the, uh, some Schrodinger uh, or some wave equation to figure out this frequency. So it's a, some sort of eigenvalue, eigenvalue from some sort of eigenvalue problem. And uh, this can, there's a whole uh, empire of mathematics behind computing this, but uh, you could, for example, do it numerically, and that's what uh, people uh, have done. Cardoso, Estunis, um, unable to remember the whole uh, group, and they have, in fact, found that beta can be larger than one half. So it means that one half plus larger than one half. Uh, is larger than one, I think. And so this is uh, better than what Christodoulos said. Uh, it can be better than what Christodoulos said. More precisely, it depends on the uh, parameters of the black hole. So the black hole must have a fairly large uh, mystery work. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is, in principle, then uh, contradicting this uh, strong cosmic censorship conjecture, even though it's uh, in a quite unphysical range of the values for the cosmological constant and charge. So it's much more uh, 
a matter of principle, if you like, uh, uh, than, than a practical problem. Anyway, so you can think of this as a, a motivation to study quantum fields. So maybe you may hope that there is maybe some quantum effect that uh, could save the day. I don't have a particularly good, I, I cannot tell you why that should, why this, why this necessarily has to work, but um, um, one can at least uh, entertain this possibility, which I'm going to now uh, do. So uh, first of all, um, when the strong sen cosmic censorship is violated, then the stress energy tensor, uh, according to this criterion, is uh, square integrable or even better. And um, so you can ask whether maybe at the quantum level, the expected stress energy tensor in a suitable state is maybe not uh, uh, integrable, at least this uh, component that we're interested in mainly. And uh, sort of the idea, um, if you like, is that uh, a quantum state contains virtual particles. I really hate to say these words, but you know, I, but, but I have it in my slides because sometimes I get these two particles exist. And these virtual particles of arbitrary uh, high frequency, and somehow it's the uh, it's this blue shift uh, effect ap applied to these virtual pairs in a sense, uh, which you could maybe say. Uh, uh, causes uh, has a chance to cause this effect. Anyway, uh, what you want is a proper calculation, and um, that uh, is what um, uh, I and um, Bob Wall here in the audience and Jochen Zahn uh, two years ago or so did based on uh, using partly also um, pioneering work of Ori, uh, Silberman, um, Lanier, and well, this group from Technion, Technion in Israel. <laughs> who uh, published uh, papers on um, quantum, uh, ex quantum fluxes in specific states before. And uh, our result, however, is a result about, uh, in some sense, the stress energy tensor in an arbitrary initial state. I should maybe go back to this slide. So the cosmic censorship is a sort of a genericity statement by, by nature. It says that uh, it asks not what happens to a particular uh, uh, initial datum, but a sort of for a generic or non-fine-tuned uh, initial datum. So you should really, if you want to uh, do the analogous thing for a quantum field, you should put an, a, a sufficiently regular uh, initial quantum state, but a, a, an arbitrary one. And uh, so the regularity of the state is something that's not so easy to describe. But for a classical field, you insist on a certain regularity because uh, clearly you could have someone shining here with an enormous laser gun along here and create some huge disturbance here or some gigantic shock. But that would have nothing to do with the whole thing. So you want to not have this. basically. This is why you say regular in a certain sense. And um, so what we showed was that um, there is a short distance singularity, so the stress energy tensor is diverging as V minus two, where V is the Kruskal coordinate. So uh, this, uh, I think V over uh, uh, one over V squared is not integrable. I think uh, one over V wouldn't even be, and so it's quite far from uh, not being an L1. Um, and this other piece is a state-dependent piece which roughly has the same regularity as the classical solution. So it has a, a much better behavior at a Cauchy horizon than this quantum field. And so, so this uh, uh, roughly the difference, I think I'm afraid I may not have written it, but so the classical behavior would be something like B minus two minus two beta. Uh, and the quantum uh, V minus two. So even formally when uh, cosmic censorship classically still holds, let's say when beta is less than one half, you see that the quantum singularity is much larger than the classical one, even when classically a strong cosmic censorship holds. And uh, the only thing you should uh, check is that this uh, constant here 
is actually non-zero, uh, which is not totally trivial because it uh, must be computed from basically solving various scattering problems in the space-time. Uh, and, and we did so by uh, solving them basically numerically and uh, computing certain scattering coefficients. Uh, it's, I have one slide here, so you need to basically consider two scattering problems concatenated. So from region one, because the waves come in from region one, so some uh, scatter into the black hole and then feed into a, a second scattering problem that happens inside a black hole. And uh, it's only those part of this which uh, arrives here at I plus. And so it's kind of, I think, intuitively clear that the quantum fluxes will uh, sort of depend on these scattering coefficients, uh, P and uh, R for the regions. And this is, uh, in fact, the case. And you, uh, you've solved them by solving a scattering problem for a, a, a 1D uh, uh, Schrodinger equation uh, like this, which is well known to anybody who's into a black hole perturbation problem. OK, so here's some results on this constant C. So the constant C is what, uh, what sets the scale for this uh, divergence. And here we, uh, for some reason, have a um, constant C tilde. So in the original work with Bob um, and Jochen, we had quite some difficulty to um, to find these uh, scattering cross section uh, coefficients because we used a, a famous method by uh, MST, some Japanese researchers from the 90s, and it's, it, it was not doing so well somehow in the in the parameter range that we were interested in. But later, with Christiane Klein, we found a better way, and we we, we were able to uh, uh, probe many more values of of the black hole mass and charge, and also we were able to incorporate masses for the Klein-Gordon fields and, and things like that. And it shows that the, the fluxes uh, given by the C uh, have, can have either sign. And if you know your uh, Rachel Drury equation, PVV is on the uh, right-hand side of the Rachel Drury equation for uh, an ingoing uh, a geodesic, uh, uh, a congruence of geodesics ingoing. So the sign of T sets uh, basically determines whether you're pancaked or spaghettified. And the pancaked, uh, 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 the spaghettified uh, sign is the plus, and this one is the other one, whether you pulled apart. I don't know. I'll not go into these horrible things. And uh, so you, what you see is kind of interesting that there are these uh, two signs are possible even though uh, classically uh, you'd expect only this one. Where, and also you note that near extremality, this, uh, it always goes to zero. So near extremality, the quantum effects, uh, at least this is numerically observed and can also be seen by your various heuristic arguments. You start off so Q over M equal to one would be extremality for without a cosmological constant and with a cosmological constant in F of This so, uh, so, uh, so this these kind of quantities in uh, in a particular state were previously also uh, computed. Uh, I should emphasize by Ori uh, Silberman Lanier, uh, you know, so earlier, and uh, in the case of the BTZ black hole by Diaz Real, which I'm going to come to, which is a qualitatively different answer, and more recently also for or without a cosmological constant. So it, most, mostly, it, it, it's, this is uh, quite characteristic. Do I have 15 minutes? Is that right? Good. OK, so this is uh, illustrating that uh, what, what one could do, or of course, what one cannot really do, so it's just Playing, uh, just thinking that you could put the classical and the quantum fluxes, you may have also classical fields around on the right hand side of the Einstein equation and then sub and then use that basically in the Rachel Dory equation. This is uh, summarizing what I just did. Uh, and uh, we also did uh, this for a massless, uh, massive field. For a massive field, you can 
uh, consider this, uh, 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 this effect for uh, increasing values of the mass and uh, it uh, shows that it goes to zero at this dimensionless combination of mu squared, the field mass, and the Schwarzschild radius m squared uh, goes to zero if you believe uh, in a particle picture which is uh, totally inadequate as I'll later say, but if you still believe that you could say this is because for a massive field it's energetically more difficult to produce this particle antiparticle uh, so positive isn't even an antiparticle for a real scalar field this virtual pairs and uh, and therefore this effect shuts down for large values of the mass Uh, the different colors represent what sum? <laughs> huh? A cosmological constant. Thank you. And, uh, I delegate. I will. I relegate any such questions that uh, I should definitely know this, so you can tell how much I have contributed in producing this slide. Okay. So now there is uh, uh, something that we uh, thought of doing afterwards, which is. Uh, 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 which is the uh, um, so this is a charged black hole still, and so it makes a much more sense to consider on a charged black hole also charged matter feeling the, the electric field uh, inside the space time. And so, what you would obviously want to do uh, is to put a, a charged scalar field where which has, of course, an energy momentum density, but which also has a charge current density as uh, given by this standard expression. And um, so what you would think is that uh, you, now you do have um, charged, uh, positively and negatively charged particles. So you would uh, naturally think that the, uh, uh, you, you create them in pairs and then the, uh, the, 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 the charged uh, positively and not negatively charged particles will, uh, will be Will fall over the correspondingly charged horizon, as you know, as you expect. Uh, 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 unlike charges attracting and like charges telling each other, gradually resulting in a discharge, you know, as you go forward in time uh, of the horizon, it's a decrease of the locally measured charge as you uh, go forward in time, and. Um, well, you can equally say that there's a current, the direction of the current is somehow uh, so as to neutralize uh, the black hole. Uh, and you can uh, follow, you can ask whether this is actually the case. And so you would uh, again compute now the quantum expectation value, uh, now not of the stress energy tensor, but of an appropriate component of the current. And uh, there uh, is a similar result that there's a, a universal uh, quantum uh, and dominant quantum divergence at the Cauchy horizon, subdominant though to the uh, one of the stress uh, tensor. And then there's a classical, let's call it classical, just a subdominant piece that depends on the, uh, uh, the precise nature of the state and that um, is behaving like a, a classical current would behave. In such a and again, there is a, a, a formula for this C in terms of certain, uh, 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 sort of certain scattering coefficients. And um, okay, so now a different. Uh, so before I say what the result is, let me say what the result would be if you did the same calculation at the ordinary horizon, the outer horizon. Here, yeah, so this is the black hole exterior. This is the usual event horizon. This is the inner horizon. So the Hawking uh, uh, particles are created uh, at the usual, the outer horizon, as one says. And so at the outer horizon, uh, as you know, there's a, the Hawking flux will always decrease the energy uh, of the black hole and it will lower the, the, lower the charge. So it will be always in the direction the current, uh, in particular, will be always in the direction that you expect. And uh, this uh, plot is, um, I, I, I guess, supposed to um, uh, 
uh, uh, supposed to, to show this. So this is here the current. And then you have different, um, different curves for a, a different value of the charge of the field. And uh, it's quite clear from this plot that the larger the charge of the test field, the easier it is to neutralize. So more charge will be carried away from the event horizon by uh, the quanta of the charge field. And so you have a larger value of the current. And um, this is supposed to be showing that the discharging effects, again, of the ordinary event horizon get weaker for larger test mass uh, of the field. And this, you would say, is because it takes more energy now to create a Hawking pair because you have to create at least a quantum of the rest mass. And therefore, uh, this effect is greater. So this is, these are numerically produced plots, but they show exactly uh, what you uh, kind of expect. Now, the um, Cauchy horizon is quite different. Again, you have a curve, and because this is not very visible, and please don't, oh, okay, at least here now works. Color coding. Uh, the point again is you have two lines. So the current can have either direction. So it can have a direction so as to charge up uh, the horizon, the inner horizon, or it can discharge it. So the discharging would be what you uh, would expect, but it can also charge it up. But uh, interestingly, as you approach extremality, this effect uh, uh, levels off or it shuts down it's like an, an emergency switch and you kind of don't overcharge uh, the, the inner horizon. You cannot overcharge it. At least that's what's uh, suggested by the numerical investigation. Okay, so that, this is a summary. Uh, so there's a, there's a, the, the, you have, a, so at the event horizon, you have a, an energy current and a charge current and they're both very small. They carry away energy from the black hole and uh, charge away from the black hole. At the Cauchy horizon, on the contrary, they're huge and they even dominate over any classical effect. The event horizon is always discharged, the Cauchy horizon or inner horizon, the same thing, can be charged or discharged. And uh, there are various, uh, 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 various um, uh, differences. So the upshot is that this picture of uh, spontaneous pair creation is just totally wrong in, this, uh, uh, in the interior of the black hole. So that's not the only, that's not the interesting conclusion, of course, is that the singularity forms for you. And uh, you, may have, you may have anticipated this because the interior is not a static space time. Yeah? So the Schilling's time coordinate goes. Okay, so now uh, I'd like to uh, come to a more recent development that has been largely pioneered by Christiane Klein, who is in, in the audience, is to generalize this to uh, from uh, the Reis and Nordstrom black holes to the Kerr de Sitter black holes. It would be even interesting to do it just for Kerr, Kerr de Sitter, because uh, it's technically easier. I, I think that's the most, the, the, the biggest motivation now, because in the case of Kerr de Sitter, uh, it has been uh, suggested or and it, that strong cosmic censorship already holds classically. So there is nothing in principle to be exp to be explained in addition, except that um, also in this case, one can see that the quantum effects are much stronger anyway than the classical effects. Um, so in fact, this is the behavior that you would uh, expect based on a quasi-normal mode analysis, um, which is already what I've written here. And at the uh, quantum level, we find, or these gentlemen have found, uh, for example, in Kerr, that's not Kerr de Sitter, but it's again due to the minus two. This is though referring to a specific state called the Unruh state. So it's not a totally general statement, it's a statement here about a specific state. And uh, so the uh, things that one would like to do is to first actually, uh, so this is a, a computation about a specific state called the Unruh state. 
And the first uh, step would be uh, to actually construct this state uh, rigorously on this space time. I say rigorously, there's, it's not that one doesn't know in principle how to construct it. It was suggested by Unruh and people. Uh, this basic idea by Unruh, of course, and but the, the sort of general prescription is quite clear, but one wants to know certain mathematical properties of the state. For example, one wants to know that it's Hadamard, which I'm going to come to, and for this, uh, one needs a proper mathematical, uh, uh, an actual construction uh, with the proper mathematical control, I would say, and this has been achieved by uh, Christiane, uh, at least for certain values of the parameters in the recent um, paper and so on. And then uh, one would like to see again that the uh, divergence of the stress tensor is basically state independent to leading uh, uh, order. This is uh, much less trivial here because of um, because of some functional analytic details, which I suppose I can explain, having to do with the fact that beta is now less than one half, and so one cannot in, in, in uh, appeal to certain inclusions of various function spaces. The mathematician will, will know this. So the, a, a better analysis of this remainder is necessary, but my understanding is that the experts know how to do it. And, and then uh, one would like, uh, then if one can say that the unruh state gives the uh, representative effect, then one would like to uh, actually compute it, and one like, would like to have a computable expression for it, and uh, then actually compute it. And this has been uh, recently achieved by us uh, with uh, paper that should appear soon. And one would like to check whether quantum fluxes, change sign, etc., uh, whether a quantum uh, angular momentum current will uh, tend to spin up or down the black hole near extremality. And one can basically say things that are quite analogous to the charged scalar field and the charge current. So now in the last uh, part of the talk, I want to go a bit into the uh, uh, more technical uh, uh, or mathematical um, aspects of this work to um, lift myself up to the mathematical standards of this conference. And it does involve spectral theory or micro local analysis. So I feel, uh, I, whereas I previously gave you just statements and plots, I, there's actually, I, I'd like to convey that there's actually some, uh, some elements of mathematical analysis involved. And um, uh, most of it is in the so-called two-point function or two-point correlation function of the quantum field, where the quantum field could be this uncharged or charged scalar field, depending on the context. And it would be on Kerr or Reisner Nordstrom or Kerr or Kerr de Sitter, depending on the context. Now, Ψ you should think of as analogous to the classical solution. So Ψ is the quantum state, and the specification of Ψ is the specification of uh, the solution. And the, uh, the, so the, the mathematician always says he writes down a PDE that he states the problem, and then he states something about solutions. So the PDE is, in quantum field theory, is the PDE of the quantum field that's still analogous, but then the fields don't commute and there's some so-called operator product expansion that expresses the non-commuting nature or fluctuating nature of the field that uh, we, we need to give. And we need to say, uh, we want to say something like the state is smooth or regular because we don't want to describe a state where someone fires a laser cannon at the Hakoshi horizon and creates a huge flux because that's just an annoying disturbance having nothing to do with the feature that we want to investigate. So we need to state that the state, the, the field is smooth. And since uh, the field is distributional one way or another, in a sense, it's not straightforward to do that by saying that this is a smooth by distribute smooth function in x and x prime, uh, it just isn't. But it, uh, what we want to say, it's non-smoothness 
has to be of a certain characteristic type. And uh, the, this uh, is expressed um, in the modern way, not so modern anymore, but uh, just, um, the, the, this is clearly the correct way to say it, saying that the, uh, the Salmander wave front set is uh, of this uh, correlation function is uh, contained, is not totally wild, but contained in a certain set. Uh, so one aspect of this set is that the uh, energy momentum co-vectors have to be light-like and on the same by characteristic strip. And this is uh, sort of follows basically by the propagation of singularities theorem, uh, which is a consequence of the field equation. But there's an additional condition which says that the time component of this uh, momentum or co-vector is, is positive, that is a positive energy condition, and its condition is stating that the state contains no extractable negative energy in the UV ultraviolet or short distance limit. Yeah, it has no extractable negative energy. Okay, so there is a, a way to, to uh, trade this condition for a local uh, geometric condition, which uh, gives the precise uh, local uh, asymptotics of this function uh, as the, a certain geometric quantity appearing in the theory of geodesics and the geodesic systems, so on. So the relevance of it is that uh, one defines the square of the field or the energy momentum tensor by not taking x equal to x prime, which would not only be mathematically meaningless, but it would it would not be phi squared. It would be the fluctuations of phi. We don't want the fluctuations of phi. We want the long-term trend of phi that uh, minus the fluctuations. So the fluctuations being subtracted are these geometric quantities. So that's how we actually compute it. And uh, then uh, uh, the question is uh, how to get such states, for instance, uh, in the in the in the curve space time or this unruh state, and uh, the basic idea is uh, uh, that's uh, due to I guess and Bob may correct me due to basically Hawking and, and people at least of this era is to pose a positive frequency condition on a characteristic surface. So I've drawn for you a cone because that's what I considered in my thesis, not because I wanted to I didn't know what Hawking did. What, also, but uh, uh, I wanted to have a, a construction like that and to be able to show that the state is Hadamard inside this cone and using this uh, um, uh, microlocal techniques and then first the matter. There's a, there's a considerable generalization of uh, such a thing. And so if you uh, apply this to black hole space times, the light cone is now not the light cone, but it's, it's a union of horizons and scry and uh, similar groups apply, apply as uh, shown by Dapiaggi, Moretti and Pinamonti and more recently in this context of the charge and curl black holes in Delta Christiana mostly Christiana the curl black hole and um, maybe I'm running out of time so uh, technically you make some ansatz for this uh, two point function which is basically prescribing it uh, on the respective horizons, maybe this is not too obvious from this plot, from this sort of complicated formula, but the idea nevertheless is that you define it on some sort of characteristic surface and then propagate it inwards, just like you would do for an ordinary solution. And you make it positive frequency or positive energy on this surface, which is kind of easy. And then you have to show it this, this property is propagated. So it's kind of easy for this cone, but it's kind of complicated for car. Maybe I should uh, draw a this sorry that this is yeah, so but, um, okay, so so here you want to set up the state on a characteristic surface like so. And the problem is, of course, that this is not really a point. It just looks like a point in the conformal diagram. So you have to know all sorts of decay properties of waves 
as you go to so let's say towards the path which is a hard uh, business and uh, a hard piece of analysis that fortunately to some of the mathematician friends have basically solved. So uh, with this, I think I would uh, like to conclude. Um, there's a strategy of a proof, but I'd like to just thank for your attention.